Without further ado, I'd like to introduce to our speakers. Tonight we are talking about atheism, humanism, and recent going-ons. Uh, first of all, we have Stephen Law from Heathrop College <laughs> in the University of London. He is also a philosopher and editor for Think Magazine. And of course, we also have Richard Dawkins, who does not need any further introduction. Um, so I'd like to pass you on to them, and thank you very much for coming. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yeah, pretty good? Okay. Um, so, um, the, we're going to have a conversation. I'll be asking Richard questions and he can come back at me as we, as we go along. Um, we'll, we'll talk for maybe 45 minutes or so and then there'll be 45 minutes, roughly 45 minutes for Q&A. You can ask either one of us a question and there's a roving, a roving microphone. So, um, I'll begin by um, asking Richard a question. Okay. Um, I'm a philosopher. I'm very interested in science and reason. I've worked a lot in the, in the field of philosophy of religion. I've published papers in the philosophy of religion. But I've also become very interested in other beliefs of a, of a supernatural and paranormal nature. And I find that when I have conversations with people um, about these kinds of topic, and when people begin to feel that perhaps what they believe is being threatened in some way, that science and or reason is beginning to encroach on their territory and perhaps is beginning to threaten the credibility of what they believe, that all sorts of smoke screens and manoeuvres are wheeled out. And one, of, one, of the, one that was, was given to me just very recently, this week, a couple of days ago, when, when we were talking about what happens to us when we die, um, somebody accused me of being arrogant and prideful uh, for suggesting that you know I might have a quite a good, <laughs> quite a good idea about what happens to us when we die, um, phrases like "Well, there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in your philosophy" uh, tend to be wheeled out, and there is a suggestion that really I should be showing a little bit of humility and acknowledging that you know there are great mysteries out there, and that I'm just a mere human being. Um, that I should just take a step back and uh, acknowledge that these are things that I can't truly understand. And I was, I was wondering, how do you... That's obviously very irritating. <laughs> but I was wondering, what, what, what's a good response to that? And do you think there's any truth to it at all? That quotation from, from Hamlet, uh, I was told the other day by a scholar of English, we some, it, it may be that, that we get it wrong. Uh, and it, it's normally read, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. Right. Um, it, the suggestion is that, the in, that Shakespeare's intention was there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy, where, where it's just a kind of yuck. It just means philosophy uh, generally. But right. that's, a, that's a, an aside. Yeah. Um, yes, it, it's obviously a thing that I very often meet. Um, the lesson of history is that uh, we should never be so arrogant as to think that present-day science is it, that present-day science knows everything. Uh, and that there's nothing more to be discovered. Um, if we take the history of science seriously, then we should be alive to the very real possibility that the science of 200 years hence will be mind-bogglingly different from what it is today. It may not be. I mean, maybe one day physics will come to an end. Um, one day people really will be right when they say physics has come to an end. But it would be rash of anybody to say that. So my anticipation would be that if we could get into a time machine and come back in 100 years, 200 years, we would have our minds totally blown by the physics that we find, maybe even the biology that, that we find. But of course, it's totally illogical to say that because we don't yet know what the physics, what the science of the future is going to be, therefore, instead, we should put our trust in a Bronze Age document written by a, a, a gang of goat herds. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, it's going to be grand, it's going to be wonderful, but yeah. it's not going to be anything like what any religion has ever said. What, I mean, what, what's happening here, in part, is that a barrier is being erected. It's as if a, a veil is being drawn across reality, 
and we're told that uh, scientists such as yourself can, can go up to the veil and that that's your proper province, the, the natural world, the observable world. But there's stuff behind the veil. There, yeah. there are fairies back there and goblins yeah. or ghosts or gods or whatever it might happen to be, psychic powers perhaps. That's a and slightly there, different point and, it, and, and that's another point that we, that we often meet, of course, that, that, that there, is this, there is this veil and somehow um, religion or superstition has a kind of territory Yes. Um, which belongs to it, which we can't encroach upon. And there's certainly no justification for that. I mean, for the same reason as, as I said before. I mean, there's, there's, um, there are many things that we don't understand. There are maybe things that we can never understand. Right. But if there are things that science can never understand, then sure as hell nothing else can. You're not sympathetic to the view that some people might have a special ability to peek, if only dimly, through this veil. I mean, so psychics will say that, that they can communicate with the other side, that those that have passed over, and that they can then tell us perhaps what they're thinking, or there are mystics who can communicate, or have some awareness of some greater reality. You're not, you're not persuaded, well, I'm, I'm assuming, you're not persuaded that, there, that anyone might have such an ability to glimpse something on the other side that science is necessarily incapable of touching. I, I wouldn't talk about another side. What I would say is that there are plenty of things which poets, mystics, um, artists um, can talk about which science has, has no particular insight into. So um, I love poetry and um, I love even mystical poetry. Um, and um, I, I get up. An, an emotional response to it, just as I do to music. Um, and uh, so that, that in, in, in one sense, is, is outside the territory of science, but in a rather trivial sense. Yeah. Um, it, it doesn't mean that there's something that is, in principle, incomprehensible to science. It just means that, um, that it's too complicated, it's too difficult, it, it involves too much uh, complicated brain stuff, which, we, which we're not yet in a position to understand from a scientific uh, point of view. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I mean, the thing about what's behind the barrier is although it may not be observable by us, I mean, claims about the unobserved often have observable consequences, so we're in a position to refute claims about the unobserved. Yeah, what, despite like, what, the fact, what would those be? What would those observable consequences be? Well, if it's a claim about psychic powers, for example, <laughs> Um, oh, well, well or, we can test that. Or the dead yeah. communicating with us yeah, in some way. Yeah, we can way. test that. All of these things are actually potentially testable. Yes. Um, so it's not as if these things are immune to... No, that's true. I mean, if, if people Parapsychology, it seems to me, actually can be a perfectly valid indeed. scientific enterprise. And, and that, that's interesting because the, these things are testable. And um, uh, funnily enough, the, the people best qualified to test them are often not scientists, but conjurers. Yes. Um, <laughs> Because they can see through the tricks, yeah. uh, which people like psychics are, are, are pulling. Right. Let me ask you about um, some scientific investigation into um, unusual mental states. Um, there was a little while ago, some time ago now, um, a, a chap called Persinger developed, some, oh, yeah. developed yeah. something called, which has come to be known as the God helmet. Um, it's a helmet which you put on your head and which uh, creates a, a fairly weak magnetic field. And the suggestion is that when you put on this helmet, some people have some interesting psychological states, some interesting experiences. Some people feel that there's some kind of presence in the room with them, and a small number of people um, claim that they're experiencing God whilst wearing the helmet. Now, I believe that you have worn, well I know, that you have worn the God helmet. Um, and I was wondering if you could tell yes, us a little bit about um, what that was like. <laughs> the, I think it was the BBC, it was a television <coughs> company, I think it was the BBC, flew me out to Canada um, to Dr. Persinger's lab um, to test it. It wasn't a very good test, it was just me and the control was a local vicar. <laughs> and um, uh, the helmet, it's a modified motorcycle helmet, uh, and um, it does indeed pass a electric, I mean, a magnetic field through your brain. Um, you sit in a totally dark room, totally silent. It's all soundproofed for an hour. And um, 
I think I probably drifted off to sleep. I'm not, I'm not sure, but, but right. um, um, afterwards um, I was given. I mean, nothing happened. I didn't get any. I didn't get any experience. I was greatly looking forward to it. I was hoping for some kind of mystical experience. Um, I did not expect to see God. I mean, what I'd read about it before was that when people do see God under the Persinger the helmet, the God that they see is the God they've been brought up with. Right. So if they're Roman Catholic, what they see is Virgin Mary's. Um, and if they're um, Protestants, they see a different kind of God. If they're Muslims, they see Allah or Muhammad or something. Um, I wasn't expecting to see any gods, but I was hoping for some kind of oneness with the universe and, and that, that kind of thing, like going on a drug trip. Um, my friend Susan Blackmore actually testified that the Persinger helmet was even better than LSD. Oh. And, uh, um, well, I've, I've never taken LSD. Um, I've been offered a trip, which I'm still debating whether to, whether to accept. Um, <laughs> Anyway, I, I experienced nothing, and I came out, and Dr. Persinger had been analyzing my EEG rhythms while this was going on. And he told me he wasn't surprised that I didn't experience anything, because my EEG rhythms were those of the 20% who, who, don't, who don't, don't experience it. I mean, mm. there are, there are a, about 80% get something, 20% get nothing, and I'm one of the 20%. Um, the, the local vicar, who was my matched pair control, um, also claimed to have no experience when he came out. Right. But Dr. Persinger's EEG analysis showed that he was right in the extreme of the 80%. He was, he was a prime um, sub subject. Um, and what seemed to have happened is that as soon as he started to get the experience, he started to fill his mind with something else. It was though he was reciting the multiplication tables or something like that in order to distract himself. It was as though he desperately did not want to have a religious experience induced by a magnetic field. I don't know why not, No. but that was the evidence. Well, I, that, that was my next question, really. I mean, I think some people fear that if that kind of experience could be produced you know, in, a, in, a, in a purely natural way, but that somehow discredits the experience. And I mean, I've heard a number of people working in the area who are theists um, saying that, of course, this in no way undermines religious, you know, the claim that some religious experiences are reliable. This is not any kind of threat to religious belief because the mere fact that an experience can be produced naturalistically, that doesn't show that no one actually fails to have a genuine religious experience. If the helmet produces an experience, say, of listening to an orchestra, uh, a wonderful and vivid illusion of listening to an orchestra, um, it wouldn't follow from the fact that the helmet could produce that experience that one, no one ever has listened to a real orchestra. Yeah, of course right. that wouldn't mm, follow. That's right. um, and so you find that people think that, or they want to say that, the, this kind of research could not possibly threaten um, uh, the credibility of theism, the credibility of certain kinds of religious experience. What would you say about that? I suppose that if people really are visited by angels in flowing robes, um, then the angels in flowing robes would have to influence the nervous system. And so there must be something in the nervous system which is capable of, being, of seeing angels and therefore, it wouldn't be totally surprising if magnetic fields could uh, tickle that in the same way as you've, the point you've just made, that um, the illusion of listening to an orchestra um, could be stimulated by stimulating the brain in some way. So it doesn't seem to me to be a knockdown case in either direction. But I thought, sort of can see that if you wanted to believe that you'd had a vision, you might be a little bit disturbed if you thought it could be... in invoked at any time by a magnetic field, maybe in somebody else, maybe... Um, in a, in yeah, a, mm. I mean, I think that, I mean, may, maybe, the, maybe the, the threat here, so far as theism is concerned, if there is a threat, is that uh, many people point to their own experience and to the experience of many other people and say, this, this gives me good grounds for thinking that there's something to it, that my experience is of something real. But if we could show 
that these experiences um, can be produced in an entirely natural way. We can, we can, we can say that people are going to have these kind of experiences anyway, whether or not there's any truth to them, then that completely undercuts that kind of experience as, so far as providing evidence for the truth of theism is concerned. So in fact, there is some threat to theism yeah. there, despite, despite it no doubt being true that the mere fact that you can induce an experience doesn't show that no one has never had the, the real yeah. thing. I mean, I can't imagine what a non-natural cause would, would even be. It, does, it seems to me to be an incoherent idea. Right. OK. Um, I wanted to... Let's move on to a slightly different topic. Um, and that's... Which, which I've, I've got an interest in. I, I wrote a book a little while ago about um, faith schools and um, moral and religious education. And I, I know that you, you very much dislike the idea that children should be labelled a Catholic or a Jew or a Muslim, um, but this is something that they should be free to adopt later on if they wish, but they shouldn't have this thrust upon them um, you know, from the cradle. Um, I was wondering what, what's your view about religious schools? I, I'm sure that you don't think they should be state-funded, but do you think that the state should actually prevent there from being religious schools, or are you happy for there to be such schools in principle? Well, I suppose, I mean, I, I went to Anglican schools myself. Um, it, Anglican schools are pretty mild on the whole. They don't thrust it down your throat. Um, as you've correctly said, the thing I really, really object to is labelling children. Um, and you can very quickly get people to see the point if you imagine that um, children inherited the, their, the philosophical views of their parents. And you, and you talked about a postmodernist child or an existentialist child or a Marxist-Leninist child or something like that. Mm. Um, and y you laugh when, when anybody, anybody says that, nor would you talk about an, an ornithologist child or something, unless the child happened to be interested in birds, which I hope it would be. Um, but religion is the one exception. Right. And, and until it's pointed out to people, they immediately um, have, have no problem with talking about Catholic children. Two-year-old Catholic child um, and it's because we all buy into the actually ludicrous idea that a child is, is as likely to inherit or should inherit the religious beliefs of its parents in the same kind of ways it inherits the eye colour um, or, the, or the hair colour. Um, so somehow religion has got itself into this privileged position of being regarded as hereditary in a way that uh, no other um, philosophical view is. And so any, any faith school which actually tells children, you are a Catholic child, therefore this is what you believe, that does seem to me to be wicked. Um, on the other hand, a school that teaches religion, uh, teaches about religion, teaches children there are things called religions, and there's the Christian religion, and the Muslim religion, and the Jewish religion, and the Buddhist religion, the Hindu religion. And this is what they believe, and there are subdivisions of them, and this is, this is what they believe. Um, that is sensible, that's what should be taught, mm. uh, because you can't function in the world today unless you know about these different beliefs that pervade different parts of the world, any more than you can function without, without knowing that um, Venezuela is in South America. Yeah. I mean, um, so I, I think that, that's important. So I, I wouldn't wish to, to ban religious education far from it. Right. What about a school that, um, it describes itself as a Christian school, and it says this is our Christian ethos, and we want children to really be immersed within Christianity, but we encourage every child to think independently and critically about these ideas and these beliefs, and we want every child to know that it is their free choice whether they accept them 
or not? So how comfortable yeah, that, or uncomfortable yeah, would you be? I, with a, if if that if they really lived up to that, I, I think right. I would be I would be comfortable with that. Right. I mean, it. I so would I. In fact, mm. I mean, I think I think probably. What I really have a problem with is not, is not religious schools at all, it's authoritarian yeah. schools. I mean, if, if schools started opening up and down the country that were political schools, yes, um, exactly. the yeah. Marxist schools yeah. and neoconservative schools, yeah. and if each day started with a rousing political anthem, and if the schools selected on the basis of the parents' political beliefs, and if there was portraits of political leaders beaming down from the classroom walls, and if each day had you know, involved some learning of the political tenets of the, uh, yeah. you know, some doctrine, uh, we would all be outraged. I mean, that, you've hit insane. the nail on the head, that's exactly right. Now, and if you just cross out political and right yeah, religious, you'll yeah, find exactly. there are schools like that up and down the country, mm -hmm. and those are the, those, now, those are the schools that I would have a problem with, yeah. but I had just as much a problem with the political equivalent. It's not so much the but religion... There is, but there isn't a political equivalent, that's the point. Right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and, and that's the... That's the Exactly the point you've made, that if there were schools that, that taught a political ideology um, or an ideology in literary criticism or something, hmm. um, then, then you would object to it and so would everybody else. But, but, but because it's religion, it doesn't get the same objection. Right. Because, the, I mean, those political schools are exactly the kind of schools that you would find under totalitarian regimes. And we would point to them and say, oh, I certainly wouldn't want my child brought up in a school yeah. like that, and we can all we can all see that. It's, it seems to me that the, really then the problem is not so much religion as that kind of authoritarian, illiberal approach. I mean, if you were given the option of getting rid of all authoritarian schools, schools that had that flavour, and getting rid of rid of all religious schools, you, you wouldn't blink. You'd get rid of the the authoritarian schools. Uh, that's what. Yes. You, that's really what you object to. Yes, it is, but they don't exist. The religious no, ones I do. <laughs> yeah. Yes, not here anyway. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Do you think that maybe then would this would this be a fair criticism um, of you that by focusing on religion and atheism and the and the divide between those two groups, um, a great deal of smoke and heat has been generated by that battle. But actually, there are people on the, on, who are religious who actually have far more in common with you in terms of being liberal, in terms of being anti-authoritarian, um, with whom you could make some kind of an alliance against the Stalins of this world who are highly totalitarian and illiberal and authoritarian, uh, but also the, the, the religious yes. uh, zealots who are totalitarian. We've, 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 we've lost sight of the more important battle because we've become so fixated on the issue about religion or atheism. Well, Do you think there's any truth to that? I mean, the, the British Humanist Association's um, campaign against faith schools is actually led by a rabbi. Yeah, that's right. Um, so yeah. he's a very good example of, yeah. of what, what you're talking about. And, and yes, of course. Um, and I keep coming back to the point that at least in Britain, we don't have Marxist schools or, or no. Nazi schools or postmodernist schools. But you'd be no less, of course you'd be no less against them. I'd be just as strongly against them, yes. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to change the subject again. Um, do you think that, talking about reasonableness and reasonable belief, do you think that in order to hold a reasonable belief, that that belief, you, you should be in a position to show that there's evidence to support it in order for it to qualify as a reasonable belief? I think I do, um, if we're talking about beliefs about the real world. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't w wish that, that, an, that an essay about the interpretation of Romeo and Juliet should be defensible by scientific means. That's a different ballgame. Right. But if we're talking about um, reasonable beliefs being beliefs about the real world, which would include not just science, but... Um, well, pseudoscience like, like astrology and homeopathy and things like that, I think that it's very, very important that the only reason to believe anything in that realm is evidence. And evidence has to be properly assessed and, and science has provided the means to do it. Right. Um, in, including statistics and logic and, and the various tools of, of thinking that have been developed over the years. Right. There was a, a philosopher called um, Clifford who said um, it is always wrong, um, it, is, sorry, it is wrong always and everywhere to believe anything on the basis of 
insufficient evidence. Um, well, perhaps maybe that's, that's close to your view. Um, but that view is often um, criticised by theists, but not just by theists. I mean, I'm not entirely comfortable with it either. I mean, there's an there's a obvious regress problem looming if you insist that every belief is supported by a piece of evidence before that belief can qualify as being reasonable. Because if the evidence is another belief, and presumably it would have to be, then that belief will in turn require another belief to provide the evidence for its truth and so on. And so you generate a kind of a... But it's not an regress. regress. Doesn't, it, doesn't it terminate at some point? Well, it will have to terminate with beliefs which are reasonable, not because they are held on the basis of evidence. I don't see why that should be. I, just because a belief is held on the basis of, an, of another belief, and the, maybe the fourth order one is then supported by evidence. But if that evidence is, is itself in the form of a belief... Well, I mean, but, but... My evidence for thinking that... Um, yeah, what would be an example? Well, um, well, in order, well, let me put it like this. I mean, perhaps the perhaps if there is a regress looming here, and some people think there is, perhaps the way out of the regress is to say that sometimes it's reasonable to hold a belief if it just immediately and directly seems to be the case that such and such. So there's a glass of water on the table in front of me, and I'm just you know. I can see it there, um, and it's reasonable for me to believe that it's there. And I'm not inferring that the glass is there on the basis of any kind of evidence. This is just the belief that I now immediately have. It's not a belief Wait, I arrive at on the basis of some kind of what, why bit of procedural why isn't it reasoning. Evidence? No, it, it, you, you, can, you can see it. Um, just, as, just as a scientist can see his instruments in the... Right. In the um, I mean, when, you, when, you, when you're a physicist and you're doing an experiment and you read the voltmeter, you're using your eyes to read the voltmeter, and it's the same as I'm using my eyes to see that there's a glass here. Okay. Well, okay. Well, maybe, let me... I'll just leave that thought and come back to it in a minute. <laughs> let, maybe, the, but maybe this is true then, that um, this is not to contradict what you've just said, that sometimes it's reasonable to believe things if it just directly and immediately appears to be you, to you to be the case. So, you know, if, I, if it looks like there's a tree sitting there and I have no reason to think there's anything funny going on, then it's reasonable for me to believe that. If it looks like there's a glass on the table and I have no reason to think there's anything funny going on, then it's reasonable for me to believe that. And that is a thought that many theists think gives them a window of opportunity because they will say, well, I've got this other sense too. Um, it's a sensus divinitatis, yeah. it's a God sense. And if it's reasonable for me to believe that there's a glass of water on the table because that's how it just directly and immediately looks to me, and that is a reasonable belief for me to hold on the basis of how things very clearly appear to be, then if it very clearly appears to me that there's a God, and he's making himself known to me in some direct and immediate fashion, then it's entirely reasonable for me to believe that there is a God. Well, yes. Um, I suppose what a scientist would say to that is that the belief that there's a glass on the table is publicly available, and it's not just my eyes, it's everybody else's eyes. Um, you, can do, you can do measurements, you yeah. can do all sorts of other things. Mm. So this is something that is um, cross-checkable with lots of other forms of evidence, whereas if I just say, I privately believe... Um, I have it in my, I, I privately experience God, and that really is no more to be trusted because it's private than the person who says, I, I know in my heart that I'm Napoleon. I mean, you know, lunatic asylums are full of people hmm. who have these private beliefs, and we lock them up. Um, <laughs> because if, if there was some way in which it could be publicly checkable uh, by, by lots of other people, and. Yeah. different methods that they are in fact Napoleon, um, then it would be different. But it, since it's private, um, as I say, we lock them up. Um, and y y we don't do that with people who say that they've had experience of God. Right. I mean, I think, yeah, you're right. It's not, it's not, intersubj it's not intersubjectively checkable, um, that no. particular experience. Um, and also, we know that people have a great many such experiences and that very many of them must be unreliable because they, they contradict each other very yes. often. They have different kinds of God experience. Yes. And we also know that they are very much 
a product of um, uh, the power of suggestion to a very large extent. I mean, just in the same way that um, reports of alien abduction tend to stop at certain national borders, so the Mexican border, for example, you don't find many people being abducted below that. So certain religious experiences tend to stop at certain yes. borders. They are a product of yeah. the power of suggestion yeah. of culture yeah. and so on. And once you know that that is largely responsible for producing these kind of experiences, that surely throws all of them into very significant doubt. Oh, so even it. if you think you're having a God experience right now, you have good grounds for questioning whether that is actually Indeed, a reliable yes. experience. I mean, the, the, you, you haven't raised this point, but it's a point people often do, do raise, that, um, that, that, that you know, I know that my wife loves me, you know that your wife yeah, loves you, and yeah. things like that, um, as though that were not based on, ev on evidence. And of course it is based on evidence, it's based upon yeah. all sorts of little signs and traces and looks and catches in the voice and things like that, yeah. um, which, are, which are evidence. They're not meter readings, but they, but they, they, are, they are evidence. And they're sometimes wrong. <laughs> yes. Um, how are we doing? Let's see. Uh, I've got a little bit more time. I'm, um, I'm a philosopher, and um, I know that Richard um, is a little bit uh, sceptical about philosophy, the value um, of philosophy. I don't think we're quite, in, in his mind, in the same camp as the theologians, the philosophers. Well, no, I, I, don't, know why, I <laughs> but, don't know why you think that, actually. But, oh, really? Um, okay. Um, um, I mean, I, you're, you're, you're right about theology. I mean, I, I don't think theology is a subject at all. I mean, I, I don't think it belongs in a university. Right. I mean, I do, I do think that, that theologians who study biblical history and, and biblical literature and things, I mean, that, that's a proper, proper subject, but those who study the theology of the transubstantiation or the incarnation or something, I mean, that is not a subject. However, philosophy does seem to me to be a subject, so carry on. <laughs> Well, okay, I'm reassured. I, thought, <laughs> um, I mean, I think that, I, I think there are questions that reach beyond science, which um, are often, though not always, or at least in some cases, they are answerable, other than by means of some kind of scientific investigation. And it by seems by to me, pure thought, you mean by, by yeah. By, I mean, and a, you know, here's a trivial example. You know, somebody might say, "Could my great grandmother's uncle's grandson fail to be my second cousin once removed?" Uh, now, you don't have to do any empirical research to figure that out. You just need to sit in your armchair with your eyes closed and have a good think and un unpack the concepts and figure out the relations between the concepts, and then you can figure out whether or not it's whether or not it's true. Yes. So there's a kind of a, a role for conceptual investigation um, which can answer questions, and you're doing it from the comfort of your armchair without engaging in any kind of oh, scientific of yeah, but, I mean, inquiry. It, it, I still call it science. I mean, that, that question about whether oh. your great-grandmother's second cousin and so on, that's something that you get out of pencil and paper and you draw it out. Uh, and you don't, admittedly, you don't do any experiments. Of course you don't, but, but you do... Um, you, you do a, a scientific um, investigation in your head, and you're, you, you're more as defining philosophical investigation as one that you do in your armchair. But plenty of well, good science goes on in armchairs. Right. I mean, there are some very famous scientific thought experiments, aren't there? There's the um, Galileo and his two, two balls. Um, there was the... I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, dear. It's that, it's that sort of audience, right? It's, <laughs> the... Um, so there was the Aristotelian view was that, um, um, that uh, had the consequence that the heavier ball should fall yeah. faster than the lighter ball. And Galileo is supposed to have gone to the top of the Leaning Tower of Pisa and thrown the big ball and the small ball off um, the top of the tower. Um, but actually, it's not clear that he ever did that. And, not, and nor is it clear that it was necessary. And nor is it clear that it's necessary no. because um, actually you can run a thought experiment, can't you? You can. Uh, which is what Galileo did. He said, well, if you... If you, if you, if you so suppose we chain the two balls uh, together and then we apply Aristotle's theory. Now, the two balls chained together makes an even heavier object, so it should fall even faster now. Uh, but, hang on, the smaller ball um, will also, being smaller, function as a brake on the larger ball 
being now connected to it. And so the two balls yeah. should fall more slowly yes. than they did independently. And so you generate a contradiction. Um, Aristotle's theory, with just one or two little additional um, clauses about what happens when you tie things together with chains, um, produces a contradiction. And so you know, without doing any science, that Aristotle's theory cannot be true. You can do it from the comfort of your armchair. Yes. So, so, so you're happy with that yeah. as an activity. Uh, but I call it science. You I call mean, it science. Yes. It's, Maybe it's, that I'm going I'm to turn out to be a scientist. Well, of course you are. Um, uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> Stephen, you, I, I've heard you have this discussion before with, yes, with, with lots, Peter yeah. Atkins, yes. um, who, re who really does have a negative view of philosophy, which, which I don't. Right. Um, and um, you challenge to produce a, a philosophical thing that problem which could only be which needs to be solved in an armchair and it was the one about why a mirror yes. um, reverses left right but not that doesn't turn you upside down mm. um, once again I mean yes you you solve that problem in your armchair right but it's a scientific problem with a scientific solution well uh, you know what see Ned Block wrote a paper on that question he's a philosopher and the journal that published it was the Journal of Philosophy, a very prestigious philosophy journal. My guess is that if you'd sent it to Nature, they would not have published it. They would have said, why have you sent this to us? There's no empirical content here. Oh, this is just... Uh, no, they might not... <laughs> I don't think they'd have rejected it because there's no empirical content. I think they'd have rejected it because they'd, they'd have said it's a trivial problem. Um, <laughs> um, but it, that's... Uh, by the way, if you, if you want to know how to solve that, that, that problem, mm. the first step is to forget about mirrors. Yes. And just get a, a sheet of glass, I mean, a, a glass door, right. a, a shop door that has open written there. And you go around the other side and it says, Nepo. Um, and um, it, it's much easier to solve it for the glass door than it is for the, for the, for the mirror. And I think the, it's simply that when you go from one side of the door to the other, you go like that. Yeah. You don't go like that. I mean, if, if there was a planet yes. where people habitually went through doors by turning somersaults over the top, yes. um, so that the way, you, you, then, then, you, then it would indeed turn it upside down. When you, Rather when than you, left to right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, 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 a, that's about half of the explanation. There's a bit more you... But I'm not going to get into that. But that's, that's exactly right. Yeah, that is the explanation. It's conceptual work. It's armchair philosophy. And it could have been done in ancient Greece by Plato, who actually thought about the problem and came up with a terrible solution. It could have been done back then, even before the development of the scientific method. I mean, yes. this was something that could have been solved from the comfort well, of one's I, I think we're banding words here, because, I mean, it seems to me that that's armchair science. Actually, Darwin could have been... I mean. Darwin's theory of natural selection could have been done in the, from the comfort of an armchair too. Mm. Aristotle could have done it, but he didn't. Um, but you don't actually need to go around the world on the beagle. You don't need to go to Galapagos um, in order to solve the problem of natural selection. You could do it from an armchair. Um, so uh, the fact that it didn't happen is just... Um, it, I mean, it's, 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 it's historically interesting that it had to wait to the 19th century and for two, possibly more, naturalists um, to solve it rather than, right. rather than philosophers. So, I mean, what, so what I find frustrating sometimes as a philosopher is that um, scientists will say, oh, the mind-body problem, you know, we'll sort that out for you, the mind-body problem. We'll just you know, do more work, create more elaborate empirical yeah. theories, and we'll sort out the mind-body problem. We don't need any philosophers on board. Um, but actually, it seems to me that, I mean, scientists certainly are able, aren't they, to establish that this is that, that these are one and the same thing, that water, the water in that glass is a vast collection of molecules of H2O, for example, or that heat is molecular motion. They establish that these identities obtain, and so why couldn't science establish that, say, my sensation of pain is a certain brain state, my C fibres are firing, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. Why couldn't science just do that? Um, but that is to overlook the fact that the, what makes the mind-body problem hard is that there's a kind of conceptual component to it. It is, at root, I think, a conceptual problem. And in order to solve that conceptual problem, you'll have to do this kind of armchair conceptual work. What, what Simon Blackburn at, at Trinity in Cambridge would call conceptual engineering. And if you don't do that conceptual work, all you'll have established is that whenever this happens, that happens, and, and vice versa. 
pain in the brain, the, the C fibers firing, but you won't have solved the mind body problem. No, and, and that has the ring of sense to me. Um, and it, it, when I think about the sensation of, of redness or something like that, and, and um, it's, it's, it's not enough to say, well, light of long wavelengths is red. Um, yeah. There's something in the brain which, um, which gives us this astonishing sensation of redness. Um, so you, you're probably right that science may not solve that problem. I'm not sure that anything will, though. Um, no, I'm, I'm inclined to agree with you. It may be insoluble. Um, there may be a kind of conceptual obstacle there that cannot be dealt with. But if it can be dealt with, it's going, be, it's going to be dealt with by philosophers, as I would call them. You'd call them scientists. But I think we're agreed about what it is that they're going to be doing. They're going to be sitting in their armchairs and reflecting. Shall I give you a quick example of what I think the problem, what that particular problem might be? I mean, here, so here's a, here's a simple argument. I'm not endorsing it. But somebody might argue that if pain just is my C fibers firing, if that's what it is essentially, well, now consider this. I can, I can conceive of it seeming to me that I'm in terrible pain, terrible agony, but actually my, my C fibers are not firing. I mean, I can imagine that as a scenario, that, that, that that's happening. Now, if that's, if that's what I'm imagining, and pain essentially is C fiber firing, then what I'm conceiving of there is not pain, it's a kind of fool's pain, like fool's gold or fool's water. It, it seems like pain, but it's not really pain because there's no C fiber firing going on, right. it's just the appearance of it. But actually, it just, there's a conceptual problem about fool's pain. Um, it just doesn't make sense to suppose that somebody could think they were in screaming agony, and yet it's just a mistake. If you think you're in pain, you're in pain. There's no possibility of error. And, if, and that error is conceptually ruled out. Now, if that's true, maybe it isn't, but if that's true, then you cannot identify pain with C fiber firing or any other physical property. There's something about the concept of pain that actually creates a, a conceptual obstacle to any kind of identity theory of that sort. Is that, I mean, I'm not saying that this is an insurmountable obstacle, but it's on the face of it, it's quite a serious obstacle, and you know I'm not I'm I'm not sure I can. I but can it seemed to me you you helped yourself there to a, a gigantic assumption, which is that it's possible it's to imagine right. that you're in pain when you're not. Um, I mean I, I can I can sit here and say I'm desperately trying to imagine myself in in pain, <coughs> because I don't understand what you were saying then. Obviously, no, I don't think I've explained it very clearly. Yeah. Um, Maybe we shouldn't go into too much more. <laughs> right. The point, I was just trying to illustrate uh, the general point that it may be that what really makes the mind-body problem an intractable problem um, is that actually it's a conceptual problem, not an empirical or a scientific problem. And you'll need to do some kind of conceptual engineering in order to, to solve it. Um, well, I'm all for conceptual engineering, okay. and scientists have to do it a lot. Right, good. We're on the same, on the same page. Um, how are we doing for time? I think... But at this point, we should probably yes. open up the floor to, yeah. to questions. Yeah. Okay. So all sorts of hands going up straight away. <laughs> Luckily, I'm not the person. I just that make sure to... my mic's working. Cool. Thank you. First of all, quick round of applause for the little discussion we had there. Thank you. <laughs> okay. We're going to do a few moments of questions. We're going to try and stop by nine, if not a little bit beforehand. Uh, first of all, anyone in the top crescent and this middle one, if you want to ask a question, please ask you to come down onto the bottom floor and stand by the door because we're not going to be able to get this mic up to you. Okay? So if anyone wants that, please make your way down now. Um, my friend Red, where has he gone? There he is. He's going to be passing the mic around to the people I point out. Um, so please, make it obvious if you want to ask a question. If you're sitting in this middle balcony here and you want to ask a question, if you're sitting in the middle, please move your wall. Uh, yourself to the outside of your row just so we can get the microphone to you, okay? Please keep the questions nice and short because um, we're going to have quite a lot of questions, okay? Thank you very much. So we'll start over here with this gentleman here. <clears throat> Thank you very much uh, for such an interesting conversation. Um, just, uh, you, you touched briefly on this area during your conversation. Um, there's a lot of talk about the scientific method, um, and it seems to me that your idea of empirical investigation 
um, in terms of ascertaining the truth value of something harks back to a time maybe a hundred years ago in which logical positivism was at the forefront of the philosophy of science. Um, it, the philosophy of science has been plagued by problems of induction and, and actually what is the scientific method ever since. And I was just wondering uh, whether you could touch upon, for, there's a whole host perhaps of areas which uh, aren't open to such uh, investigation and the, uh, the, the in interviewer um, presented a couple, maybe I could present a couple more. For example, the scientific method itself would seem resilient to scientific inquiry without being circular, or ethical values, for example, or the mathematical and logical laws. Okay, well, um, shall I take, um, take ethical um, questions, um, and mathematical as well. I mean, um, mathematical truths are, are, are obtained by deduction, uh, they, they follow, they're, they're inherent in the premises, and it's just a matter of doing clever mathematics in order to deduce them. Um, ethical principles, it doesn't seem to me, it's contrary to my friend Sam Harris, um, it doesn't seem to me that science has, at least certainly doesn't have the last word on that. that. Um, what science can do with ethics is to say, if you, you believe that such and such is a good value, um, then you are illogical if at the same time you don't believe so-and-so is. You can, you can do good moral philosophy, which is scientific principles applied to, to morals. Um, you can do good moral philosophy to show up inconsistencies uh, in people's ethical views. You can say you, you are, you're being inconsistent if you, if you, on the one hand, are against abortion, but on the other hand, in favor of so-and-so or you can point out to people those inconsistencies. So I think there's, there's a lot that you can do with the scientific style of, of um, reasoning with, with ethics. But you cannot, with, by science alone, simply say, X is wrong, and that's all there is to it. Which religious people claim to be able to do, but without any basis, as far as I can see. No, that was a good answer. I have two questions, one for each of you. Uh, to Stephen, I mean, uh, you mentioned about, you know, the pain and other thing that in the mind someone feels. Feeling... fiber firing or whatever your preferred neurophysiological event might be, uh, okay. yes. I, I wonder whether what you are talking is about the psychiatric problem or people in depression who, you know, which falls under science. I mean, that's a question. I mean, I don't know whether what you define as pain and other things, the people affected by, you know, psychological problem do have similar thing. So, is that not a science? And my question to uh, Dawkins uh, is, uh, okay, science, we, we know many things are there, you have discussed about that, but for an ordinary person uh, who, who don't have much education or even with education, but you know, very normal person from different world, how we are going to approach, because they can't understand every high level science, whether it is physics or matter, whatever you talk about. I mean, maybe only a philosophical way of approach is possible, or I, I don't know, I'm just asking that question to you. How we are going to approach normal people? Okay, thank you. Thanks. There were two questions. Well, the first was to you, I think. Yes, I think, well, the first question I think was, um, look, can't, uh, can't we have a scientific investigation of various mental phenomena, such as depression and pain and so on? And the answer to that is yes, of course we can. Um, we can certainly have that. Um, but that's not to contradict anything that I said. <laughs> Um, what, I, what I was raising was, a, was what appears to be a, a conceptual obstacle to actually identifying mental states with brain states. Um, there does appear to be such a conceptual obstacle, but that's not to say that you can't scientifically investigate both what's going on in people's brains and also um, mental states. Uh, there's all sorts of research that can and is being, in, being done on both those things. I think the second question was about um, not everybody can understand s science, and so what are we going to do about that? Um, that is a, a real problem, and, and um, as a biologist, I don't understand advanced modern physics, and I think what we have to do is that there's a kind of thing, it's a little bit akin to faith, but it's a bit different from, from faith. You say, I don't understand what physicists are talking about, but I know that physicists are subject to the discipline of the scientific method. I know that they're subject to the discipline of peer review in their papers. I know that if they do an experiment which, um, which is dodgy, that somebody else is going to come along and do the same experiment later and get a different 
uh, result. I know that there are other very clever physicists who are checking their mathematics. Um, so there is a kind of faith in one's fellow scientists, but it's a faith that's based upon evidence. It's based upon the knowledge that um, these two in their own field of science are using the same scientific method, the same criteria for judging uh, and, eva and evaluating the science. Is it on? Oh, yeah. um, well, first of all, I, also wanted, to, I wanted to respond to something you said earlier, because uh, immediately my hackles went up, um, when you said that um, mainstream schools are, um, well, they don't, they're not political. I think, you, as you said, they, there was no politics in, in the school system, or if, if politics was introduced in the school system, um, then it would, you, would, you would get your backs up because uh, you're getting irate about religious schools. But I just wanted to point out that I've got a quick list of seven things that are not questioned at all in mainstream schools, very quickly. Uh, capitalism, hierarchical structures, first past the post democratic system, scientific rationalism, male dominant society, competitiveness uh, as a, the way of life compared, compared to cooperativeness, and um, bounded discourse and rational uh, discussion. So you can only have biology, physics, you can't have anything that crosses boundaries. Um, that was just a quick list of things that are inherently in there already. Um, oh, thank you. Um, and I, my question basically was that um, if you, you were talking about how um, scientists are bound by fellow scientists making rules and laws, I feel that like, at least the religious community have a similar kind of structure where they are expected to peer review each other. You know, people don't say, there's no sort of like, within the Catholic Church, you're not allowed to say crazy beliefs about things without being peer reviewed. Um, and I, my question really relied on um, thinking about the Higgs boson, which is that only a handful of people can actually identify whether the results that are, appear on screens are a Higgs boson or not a Higgs boson. And why is that specialization any more believable than the specialization of somebody who's been through seven or eight years of, of rigorous religious training and believes that they're talking to God? Thank you very much. Well, there's a lot in that. Shall I, um, yeah. I'll start and you think. Okay. Okay. Um, well, I, I, I very much endorsed your thought that um, we should be encouraging children to think all about, about all of those things. It seems to me it's terribly important. And in fact, in thinking about them, they would be doing philosophy. Um, so, you know, thumbs up, <laughs> thumbs up to that. But that's not quite the same as saying that um, in schools, for example, all children are expected to sign up to capitalism and sing songs praising the capitalist regime and have images of... Uh, of ca famous capitalists staring down at them going thumbs up to capitalism and so on. I mean, that's not happening. Um, but if, you're t if, if your point is... Is there really? Okay. Well, I would take that down. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the point we were making, I think, <clears throat> excuse me, was that, um, that there shouldn't, you know, we should not be um, taking a particular politi political philosophy and presenting it in that kind of way, using those kind of highly manipulative methods in order to try and get children to accept it. And to, to some extent, you know, there may be some truth to the suggestion that actually to some, you know, to some extent we are doing that, uh, we just don't realise that we're doing it. Um, and you know, and I, I would have some sympathy with that view, and the cure, so far as I'm concerned, would be more philosophy, get kids to think more reflectively, ask questions about that kind of stuff. Um, in terms of um, peer review, that was, I didn't, I'm not quite sure I understood your question, but I think I... Just saying that, you know, that there are specialists in the religious field, which is my colleague here. Yes. Uh, and there are specialists in the scientific field. Uh, both of them have... <coughs> I think the thing about... Within yeah. Within the boundaries of what they're allowed to. You know. the, the, thing, the thing about... The thing about... I mean, it's, I, think, I think that in order to say that you're acquiring a skill and you're getting better at it, Right? You need some objective standard against which you can check how well you're doing. Right? So if you're, on a, if you're on a rifle range, you're trying to become a good marksman, you keep firing at the target. Um, the way in which you get better is you check the target, something objective against you, can see, you can see how well you're doing. Right? But if the target disappears every time you pull the trigger, you're never going to get any better, you're never going to acquire any skill. You need something objective against which you can check 
how well you're doing. If you don't have that, if you just have a little talking shop of people staring dimly through something and they, and they can't quite make out what it is, but there's no way of really independently checking how well you're doing, then you end up with the situation that you had with the astronomer Lowell, who looked through his telescope and thought he saw some strange lines on Mars. And then, it was Lowell, wasn't it? Yes. And then he started mapping them out. And then the, more and more detail became clear to him. And other people started looking through their telescopes. And they started drawing in the lines. Until eventually there was a consensus about this fantastic map which had been drawn. And it was all an illusion. None of it was real. But there had been a consensus which had developed. Um, why? Because there was no independent check. And once a decent telescope was produced where you could check and see what the surface of Mars was really like, it turned out it was all baloney. So what is the independent check so far as knowing how well religious people are doing? Happiness. But a, a, th a theological argument about the transubstantiation, does the, does the host really become the body of Christ or is it only symbolic? Um, how, you, I mean, how are you going to settle that? It's not like the Higgs boson where... where it, it, however, how, however the, the minority of people is that, that, that really understand it. Nevertheless, these are experiments which are testing something real. What I was going to say oh, was sorry, that, I was just question. being very quick, just to respond to that. Um, that I was just saying that, that um, happiness could be used as a measure. You, can't, you don't necessarily only have to use physical properties as a measure. You could use people's feelings as a measure as well. I have nothing to say to that. Can we move to the question that Brent's <laughs> looking Hi, I've got another question about uh, faith schools. So um, I'm a PGCE student at Oxford studying to be a science teacher this year, and I've been placed in a faith school this year, very much against my will. Um, I've got to last till Easter. <laughs> um, and I've found that it's very disappointing in a faith school. I, I thought that the, um, what would happen would it be quite uh, mild how, how much the children are indoctrinated, but in fact, they're very much required to pray and genuflect and go to mass. And I was wondering what you think people in education who are concerned about this can actually do to help? I only half heard that. I don't, I don't, I don't. Well, what, what can people who work in education do to help when, when that kind of fairly heavy-handed indoctrination is going on? I should have thought all schools. you could do would be to teach the children to think critically, to, to get the children to ask questions, to say to the children, whenever you're told anything by any of your teachers, say to them, what's the evidence for that? Say, is it based upon tradition? Is it based upon faith? Is it based upon revelation? Is it based upon authority? If it's based upon any of those things, chuck it out. Um, I, the, only, the only reason to believe anything in that, in that line would be, would be evidence, and there isn't any. I, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> but, um, I, I think that the government should introduce minimum standards that all schools, independent, state, whatever they are, should meet um, so far as moral and religious education is concerned. And the, the, the first one is every single child should be told that it is their free decision whether or not to accept a particular faith that their school um, espouses. That should be told to them repeatedly over and over again so they really believe it. Um, they should also be presented with... <laughs> They should also be presented with a range of different faiths and also humanist, humanism from people who actually hold those faiths. Because, say, very often, although you get a range of faiths being presented, it's be, the, the range of faiths is being presented by someone who's highly partisan. Um, and I know from experience that, you know, I, you know, I get invited into schools sometimes to talk, and I know from experience that, um, you know, the, the, the chaplain or the rabbi will want to be in the room <laughs> while I'm talking, just to hear everything I say so that the minute I leave it can all be rebutted. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not a level playing field, really. Um, there's a lot of control, often, that goes on in a slightly clandestine way. They are not... Everyone likes to sign up to truth and reason and let's get the kids to think, but then they say, ah, oh, but not too much and not too early and all sorts of qualifications then come in and that, that concerns me. So I, I think all schools should be encouraging kids to think and question, should be encouraging kids to think that it is their own free decision whether or not to sign up to these faiths. Having said that, I think there are lots and lots of religious people who would agree with that and there are many religious schools that would happily embrace that philosophy. So this is not an attack on religious schools per se, it's just an attack on a certain style of religious school. Thank you, Dr. Doctons, for coming out. Uh, I wrote down my question, so I wouldn't like ramble like some of these people. 
Um, I recently watched your interview uh, with, Do with Dr. Ben Stein, and um, when he asked you if intelligent design is possible, you said that it could be possible through some intelligent life force like aliens or something like that. Do you think that is a more probable explanation than evidence for God? And if so, what is your evidence? Why did you come to that conclusion? That's a very interesting event that happened. Um, I was interviewed by this man, whom I later discovered was called Ben Stein. I'd never actually heard of him before. Um, I was invited to go on that program, along with several other scientists, and we were told this was going to be an objective uh, discussion of the whole issue of intelligent design. We were not told that it was um, a propaganda exercise, which it turned out to be. Um, I was asked the question you said, could I, could I imagine any circumstances in which life on this planet could be uh, intelligently designed? Now, if you've read the intelligent design literature, you will know that the leading proponents of it, people like Dembski, are very keen to distance themselves from God. When they're talking to their own people, they talk about God all the time. But when they're talking about um, to, to scientists, they will say, we don't know who the designer is. All we want to do is to show scientifically that there's evidence for design. And so they are very keen to try to find alternative designers who are, who are not God. When Ben Stein asked me that question, could I imagine any circumstances in which um, life on this planet could be intelligently designed? I bent over backwards to try to think of a positive answer. The only answer I could think of, and it's a very, very improbable answer, it's one that I do not for one moment believe, the only, in, the only conceivable way in which life on this planet could be intelligently designed would be if it was designed by an alien from outer space who had evolved by something like the Darwinian process or if he'd been designed, then the, the, you know, ultimately that regress has got to be stopped by something like the Darwinian process. That's what I meant to say. I think that's actually what I did say, though that bit, of course, was cut, along with lots of other, along with lots of other things. Ben Stein, when, when I had said, it's highly improbable, but if you really, really twist my arm to try to think of a way in which life on this planet could be intelligently designed, if you twist my arm, then I will say possibly um, designed by some evolved life form, evolved life form <laughs> on, an, on another planet. What did Ben Stein do? He cut out that bit. He said, wait a minute. Dawkins believes in little green men. <laughs> That's what went out with your friend Ben Stein. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, the latest and greatest in faith news is the Pope is, of course, resigning. Um, allegations have come out today that he approached the Italian president for possible immunity towards um, court procedures for the Catholic um, child molestation cases and the child abuse. What do you think the fallout will be of having a resigned Pope who could be potentially subpoenaed and get into court to face these charges? And who's going to be subpoenaed? Well, it's possible that uh, Pope Ratzinger, or Pope uh, Benedict, um, after he's finished resigning, could be subpoenaed uh, or arrested um, in, con uh, in, in connection to his time as the, the head of um, discipline at, at the church and moving around all the um, allegedly child-abusing priests. Well, um, I was one of those who uh, actually paid a lawyer to look into the case and to provide a, the... Um, the case for the prosecution, uh, this was done by Jeffrey Robertson QC, um, and um, I and um, Christopher Hitchens raised the money to pay him, and I think I paid half of it myself. Um, so the case, for, um, the case for the prosecution, so to speak, has been laid out by Jeffrey Robertson. Um, it would be certainly interesting to see that really come to court. Um, I don't think anybody's accusing uh, Pope Benedict of, of child abuse himself, but, uh, but rather of being complicit in covering up uh, what was going on. And, it, and, and I, I wouldn't wish to preempt any, any judgment, but if, if there's some serious case that he might be arrested, 
I'd be interested to see the outcome. I rather doubt it, I more than rather doubt it, it'll happen. A short question for Mr. Dawkins. Uh, if I will understand your standpoint, it seems to me that being against religiosity and religion, you understood completely what religion is. If you understood that, it means that you know very well what religion is. So, can you please give me a definition of, of what religion is? And if you have it, I must tell you something that we, who are in a precarious condition of being believers, we don't know what religion is. I studied a bit what religion is, but I didn't understand. Believers believe in revelation, in what it's given to them. Okay, thank you for that and that's why I want you to, to, tell, to give me a definition, because if it doesn't, it doesn't have a clear understanding of what religion is, okay. That, uh, it should not be against religion. Thank you, Thank you very much. Well, my understanding is that, is, that re is that the word religion, as opposed to faith, is to do with, I mean, it literally comes from binding, so it's to do with the organization of people who have a certain faith into a community uh, which, um, which binds together the people who do, have, who do share that faith. Um, I'm not that interested, actually, in the distinction between religion and faith. Um, I, I think that um, uh, faith is one of the great evils in the world uh, and um, it, to the extent that, that religion organizes faith, it's, it, it, it's part of that. I just wanted to ask whether you saw there being an end point as such to this debate and if so, is, is the ideal end point that there is no religion or do you think it ever will end? This is a question about look, looking into the future and seeing what might happen in, in human society with respect to religion. Will, will religion eventually disappear? And you're not asking me what I hope, you're asking me what I expect. Well, uh, perhaps both? Well, obviously, you know what I hope. <laughs> um, uh, um, I, 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 I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic, but I think it'll take a, a very long time. I mean, the, the more the more we have good education, the more religion will wither and die. Thank, thank you for everything. Uh, two years ago, I attended a conference in Stockholm, a conference which takes pl place annually. Uh, it's a philosophy conference, you might know about it. And uh, the, it was a group of scientists from, from the States, I think, saying that they, they did genetics. And they had a very difficult moment, a crisis, and they couldn't go forward with the research. And eventually, somebody in the group tried praying. And they pray, and they got the... Um, at the end of the prayer, they got a solution. They, act, uh, they acted on it, and it worked. And it happened again later. How can we explain that? Your point is? I, I ask, how do we explain that, <laughs> such a situation? <laughs> You cannot be serious. <laughs> <laughs> the conference took place in, in the room. The conference took place in the room where Nobel Prize. The reason you're is telling the story. I'm asking. The reason you're telling the story is that you got the result you wanted. Nobody ever says, do you know there was this conference in Scandinavia and they didn't get the result and they prayed and it still, they still didn't get it. <laughs> It doesn't happen like that. You only tell the story when something like that appears to happen. It's going to happen from time to time, and that's when you tell the story. Um, this is uh, on the subject of religious belief. Um, do you think belief in a god is just the product of indoctrination and the occasional mystical experience, or do you think it could actually be instinctive in some people? Well, that's very interesting, um, because what you could be meaning by that is, are certain people, but when you say instinctive, you mean that there would be some sort of predisposition in certain brains due to genes, perhaps, um, which makes people more susceptible 
to uh, the, the, whatever influences it is that makes people religious. That seems to me to be quite probable uh, because so many other things are influenced by genes. It would be rather surprising if a susceptibility to religion was, was not under genetic influence. My question is about the nature of scientific evidence. Uh, you both said, and I think most people would agree with you, that we're justified in holding a belief if we can find evidence for it or if there are logical arguments uh, that support it. But it seems like that in itself is a belief which would require some form of evidence. So if so, what do you think would count as evidence for that? And if not, yeah, how do we justify choosing that heuristic without appealing to that same sound of evidence that we're trying to justify? Have you actually got the microphone? Because it's not... OK, can you not hear me? Or... A bit closer to your mouth. Okay, so I'll repeat That's that. Better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so the question's about the nature of scientific evidence. Um, you, you both said, and I think most people here would agree with you, that we're justified in holding belief if there's evidence for it or if there are logical arguments we can find that support it. Uh, but it seems like this in itself is a belief which would require some form of evidence. And so if so, I'm wondering what you think would count as evidence in favour of that and... If not, uh, how do we justify choosing that heuristic without appealing to the same standard that we're trying to justify? So how, how do we justify, um, as it were, f faith that, that, that science will give us the truth? Is that the place? How do we justify scientific method? Yes. Basically, um, what he said. It works. It, it, it works. Um, planes fly, cars drive, mm. computers com compute. It's an inductive argument. Um, <laughs> um, if, if, you, if you base medicine on, on science, you cure people. If you base the design of planes on science, they fly. Um, if you base the design of rockets on science, they reach the moon. It works. Bitches. <laughs> And I just, I didn't say, um, just to clarify, I didn't say that um, <clears throat> a belief is reasonable only if it's based on um, evidence or some kind of rational argument. In fact, I questioned that. Um, and I, actually, I don't believe it's true. Um, but uh, that's another long story. We won't, we won't open that can of mine. Thank you very much. Um, just after Christmas, we went to London and saw the scroll of Jack Kerouac's On the Road, which you may know is, was sort of pasted by him so that he could sort of type out the whole thing in a sort of creative frenzy. And I was thinking in a way that this was a kind of a revolt against rationalism and a kind of element of spirit that um, shows that people... <coughs> Will actually not even if religions are all gone, they won't be completely satisfied with a purely religious, um, a purely rational and scientific society. What do you think about that? Not a lot, really. Um, <laughs> I did. did. Right. Um, I've got. Shall I say something in the? Yes, please do. <clears throat> You have a thing. Um, so, <coughs> the last few questions, not yours quite so much actually, but there's a, the way in which the conversation appears to be heading at this point is, or the thoughts that appear to be raised are what, I, what I've called, um, I, I wrote a book called, um, I plugged my book, I wrote a book called Believing Bullshit. And in that book, there's a chapter called Going Nuclear. And going nuclear is a strategy that people employ in an argument when they suddenly realise that the tide of rationality is going against them. Um, and then they reach for the nuclear button. And the nuclear button is a kind of a, is usually a sceptical argument. It's either a relativist argument or a sceptical argument. In a religious context, it's almost always a sceptical argument. They will run some kind of argument for why reason itself 
is untrustworthy, cannot be justified. There's some kind of circularity involved in any attempt to provide a justification for reason because you will be using reason, and thus the justification will be wholly circular. And there you go then. Reason is just another faith position, they say, and all of your arguments count for nothing now. Uh, it's all been laid waste. Every position is as reasonable or unreasonable as in every other. And then having devastated everything, they walk out the room fast, leaving you to clear up that mess. Um, and that is an intellectually dishonest strategy for people to adopt if they trust reason on a day-to-day -day basis and, in fact, in every other corner of their lives, which they do. And, in fact, you generally find they will use reason in their argument up until the point where they realise they're losing. And only then do they press the nuclear button. So they do not do it in good faith. They are simply applying a certain sophisticated philosophical puzzle and you know, to generate as much dust and confusion as they possibly can in order to get out of the room fast, leaving you to clear up the mess. And you can be damn sure that as soon as they're out, as soon as they've made their escape, they'll be using reason again. Well, they need reason to, to open the door. I mean, uh, um. Yes. <laughs> and of course, they'll be using reason in order to undermine reason. <laughs> so uh, it, it's, a, it's an intellectually dishonest strategy. People ought not to do that. Do not use reason Trust your life to reason, which you do on a daily basis, all of you. Um, and th but then, when you find yourself cornered in a particular area, such as religious belief, say, suddenly start reaching for the nuclear button on reason and saying, oh, reason is just another faith position too. You don't really believe that. Um, and it, so it's intellectually dishonest. Oh, sorry. I don't think you were necessarily doing that, though. I'm pointing, you were the last person to speak, and maybe that wasn't quite fair. Yeah, sorry. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, I thought the point you made earlier, um, Richard Dawkins, is very interesting um, about how science allows us to uh, show whether morals are inconsistent or consistent. Um, but as our society and technologies are advancing, we're becoming um, more and more, I guess, scientifically caught up with ethics as well in uh, how, we, uh, how we progress. And I was just wondering, how do you personally determine the foundation for your morals and ethics when, uh, as you say, science can't tell us what is right or wrong at a fundamental level. It can only tell us what's consistent. And how do you think as a society we should be progressing with determining uh, what's acceptable or unacceptable or what we should be placing our values um, and our energy and our time on as a as an, uh, society of people? Um, and if it's just based on feelings of what it feels okay for someone at the bottom line, you know, is that really justified and what does that really mean? Yes. Um, um, Stephen will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that the, the position that I would take in moral philosophy would be called consequentialism. That, that's a term, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, to me, what, when, when, when I'm faced with a, with a moral dilemma, I would ask a question like, who suffers? Or, how can we increase happiness? Um, and I wouldn't, and, and I would then have to ask subsidiary questions like, well, whose happiness are we talking about? Is it only human happiness? Or are we talking about the happiness of any sentient being? Uh, this is an interesting question which um, science bears upon because if you're talking about non-human non -human animals, um, then a question like, do they have brains like ours? Do they, is it likely that they suffer in the same kind of way as we do? Um, have they evolved from the same sort of ancestors as we have? And the answer is, of course, yes. Um, if, you, if you want to base your morality, as many people do, on a, a rigid wall of separation between our species, Homo sapiens, and all others, then science, again, immediately steps in and says, well, hang on, um, at what point in the evolution of humans would you, would you erect that barrier? Um, if, for example, we can do a thought experiment, an armchair scientific thought experiment, we can say, suppose that the, um, that the, the ape men, ape women, um, who, are, who, who link us to chimpanzees, going all the way back to six million years ago to the common ancestor of chimpanzees and then all the way forward again to us, suppose that there were an unbroken chain of intermediates who all happen to survive. As it, as it turns out, they're extinct. And so we are, we are totally distinct from chimpanzees. But if they hadn't, by the sheer accident, gone extinct, then there would be a, 
an unbroken chain of interbreeding intermediates, and I mean interbreeding, between us and chimpanzees. So the only way in which to erect a morality that was human-based and distinguished so-called animals from humans would be to have apartheid-like courts to decide whether so-and-so passes for human or not, as they had in um, South Africa with passes for white. Um, so science can't tell you what's morally wrong and right, but what it can do is you can do scientific thought experiments and you can show up the problems in your, in your moral thinking, in your, in your ethical thinking, by doing such thought experiments. And the same thing with um, the, pro the progression of, of embryos um, when talking about, about abortion, that kind of thing. It seems to be your standpoint that religion and science are at loggerheads, um, but you say there's questions that religion can't answer and there's also questions that science can't answer. Do you not see that science is just the new religion, let's say, that um, shows people how to act in, uh, social, uh, in social situations and, uh, I guess, hierarchy and things like that? No. Um, you have faith in science, and you said no, that is the um, I, I think that the science is very different because it is based upon, upon evidence. I, d I think it would be completely wrong to say that science is like a religion. Um, science certainly does answer some of the questions that historically religion aspired to answer, questions of origins, questions of where we all come from. Um, and so there are some deep and interesting questions that historically religion attempted to answer, but answered wrongly. Um, and science now attempts to answer and is getting the right answers and may not have them all yet, but is progressing in that direction. I don't think there's any, um, there's any basis for that kind of rather facile comparison. Okay. I'm going to take three more questions and then we're going to stop. So we can take all in the row and then allow uh, Stephen Rich to answer them all. So this gentleman here standing at the back. First. Um, I've got a question for Professor Dawkins. So, um, based on your argumentation, I didn't see a difference between, between God and love, because you said, say, if God reveals himself to me, and I believe in God, this evidence is not publicly available, like a glass of water, for example. So say that's not true. On the other hand, if you say, say I've got a wife, and I believe my wife loves me, because you say it's evidence that she's got some facial expressions or something along the lines of that. But I think that's actually the same kind of revelation because if other people see the expression um, my wife has when she looks at me, they don't see any love, probably. But I see the love because... Um, because, because no, I, but they, they probably see it differently, I guess. So, yeah, okay. so I, I, I see the love because, um, because it kind of... It's, do you know what I mean? It's kind of like yes. it's, it's a relation I mean, it, by it's itself. A, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a clever point. It, you're, you're, what you're saying is that my, my point about Napoleon, about people who think they're Napoleon, that's, that's private, and we, say, and, we, and we lock them up. What you're saying is that somebody who says his wife loves him, he's the only person who thinks his wife loves him. Nobody else believes it um, because they don't see the, they don't see the, 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 the private um, little looks and squeezes and things like that. Um, I, I, I think it, well, although I call it clever, I think it's actually, you can kind of break it down. I mean, what, th that sort of evidence is susceptible to investigation by other people if they look hard enough. They usually don't bother. Uh, but um, um, it, what, whatever the cues are that, t that tell you that your wife loves you, those are in principle investigable by other people. And you could be wrong, as I said before. Two more questions. Uh, yeah, pr a question for Professor Dawkins. Uh, we were talking about evidence and scientific evidence, uh, but there are different sciences, of course. Um, I wonder about a comparison between, say, biology and, and physics. Um, if you look at physics, which is generally a mathematical theory, um, there are all sorts of things which tend to be replaced when a, when a theory changes. Like, we no longer think that heat is a caloric fluid, for example. But the mathematics still works, and that's what you told one of the questioners before, that ultimately science works. Um, now, when it comes to something like evolution, on the other hand, it seems to be of a different kind. It seems to be an explanatory theory, which sort of unifies um, seemingly disparate uh, phenomena. Um, but when there's theory change, what will be preserved on a theory which is not a 
a theory which makes predictions, or does it make predictions? So you're saying that in physics, um, things change, and the physics of the 17th century is superseded. But the mathematics tends to, you might say the structure of the mathematics y yes. is preserved. The as mathematics you is preserved in the sense that, for example, Newton's theory of gravitation, which never a was a theory case. of gravitation, just simply was um, a limited a, case. A, a, an empirical law, the mathematics of which gives the, approximately the right answer. Um, then you came on to evolution, um, where I suppose it's fair to say that, that that is not going to be superseded in the same way. Um, this is, this is, are you saying that, that this is definitely true and, and, and it's not going to be? Oh, 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 it makes, oh, sure it does, yes. I mean, um, admittedly, sorry? Yes. Um, the, the theory of evolution makes, makes predictions, certainly. Admittedly, in some cases, they're predictions about the past, but it's still a prediction that if you go and, if you go and dig up fossils, you will find that the fossils come in the right order, for, for, for instance. I mean, that's a, that's a prediction. Hello. Uh, question to both, actually. Um, looking at it from the point of view of science and philosophy. Um, to believe or not to believe? This uh, question has been bugging me. Uh, is that just a random variation of our biological makeup? Or is there something more to it uh, in that individuals have a, a different um, option, say, in some of us, even if have been brought up uh, religious, quite early on, have, dis have discovered in ourselves that we can't bring ourselves to believe what we, what we, we are being told. Is that just, a, um, as I said before, a random variation of our biological makeup, or is there more to it in terms of our, uh, it, it, is that difference key? to our evolution as human beings. So you're saying that, that, that there, are, there are people who uh, reject religion despite being brought up with it and other people who accept it. I very much am, am a case of and that and I know the people who are too. Yes. So and, is and there more to it than just a, a random bi biological variation of it? Well, I wouldn't... Is there, is there a purpose to our own evolution? I doubt if it's random, but, uh, but I mean the, the difference between people who accept it and people who reject it is doubtless a a complicated function of their, of their genes and education and things like that. I, I wouldn't call it random, but, but you seem to be going a little bit further and suggesting that maybe we're, 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 we're evolving by natural selection to become better at it or something like that? Yeah, where would you speculate that that is relevant to our process of evolution? If, if you think about the dark ages, just to give you an example, how we move on... Well, I don't think that we've genetically moved on since the Dark Ages. I mean, I think we're, you know, gene genetically there hasn't been that, that, that kind of change. Um, if, if you mean, um, might we evolve in the future to become better thinkers or something like that, um, that would only be the case if the better thinkers were the ones who had the most children. <laughs> Okay, thank you. I just want to ask if Stephen Law has a closing. No. Um, well, that, that was a great answer. I don't know if I could um, add anything to it, other than I'm pessimistic about the better thinkers being the ones that have the most children. I think. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, that closes the main part of the event. Um, a tradition is to give our uh, speakers a T-shirt. So thank you very much for being here and taking part. Oh.